Hola a todos. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third virtual event of the Hispanic Latin history designs. The purpose of the series is to expose the diverse history of design production in Latin America. And this event is the result of the cooperation between SODA and A AIGA Baltimore with the support of Stevenson University and AIGA Un Unidos. Today, we will be learning from Nicole Cristi and Javier Amansi, researchers from Chile and co-authors of the book Resistencia Gráfica, Graphic Resistance. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Javier. Welcome. It is an honor to have you with us. We're also very happy to have all of you here this afternoon. My name is Raquel Castedo. I am a member of the board of uh, directors of AIJ Baltimore and of the Society of Design Arts known as SODA. SODA was founded over 15 years ago in Baltimore by an old volunteer group of teachers, students and design professionals. All of them were passionate about the multiple histories of design arts, including graphic design, illustration, architecture, book arts, photography and many more. SODA has offered over 100 seminars that explored various topics. To get an idea of our past events, please visit our website at sodabaltimore.com and uh, sign up for our mailing list to find out about upcoming events. On our website, you will see that since 2019, we have been co-organizing events with AG, AIGA Baltimore and building together a community that is interested in the history of design and its positive impact on the practice of design on contemporary life. Our partnership with AIJ is essential. This organization is committed to promoting the value of impact of design, to work together to inspire, support, and lend together at every stage of our careers. Our 75 locations are 100% managed by volunteers, and they serve more than 20,000 members across the country. We invite you to learn more about all of our in initiatives at AIGA.org and want to thank all the leaders of our headquarters, the members, the national representatives, and about all the members of our local board of directors, in particular to our new president, Francis Miller, who is with us today. For more information about our headquarters and to find out about the upcoming events, please visit our website baltimore.aiga.org. Also, very special thanks to our interpreters, Julieta Mendez and Laura La Fuente. And I would like to thank uh, the Stevenson University and AIGA Unidos, particularly to Natacha Poggio, who is with us today. Natacha will tell us a bit about AIGA, AIGA Unidos and the celebration of the Hispanic Heritage Month 2021. Welcome, Natacha. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you today. I want to tell you a bit about AIGA Unidos. We are a multi headquarter space that fosters histories, the needs uh, of people who have Hispanic and Latin heritage around the world. We are carrying out several events right now related to ce celebrating the Hispanic Heritage Month. You can join us. This is one of the events that we are co-organizing or yeah, co-sponsoring. And we have upcoming events uh, next week as well on October the 7th and then on October the 12th. These events uh, are related to the Hispanic month, but then we will carry on with several other events. And please follow us at AIGA Unidos, and I will leave the link to the website in the chat box. Thank you. Back to you, Raquel. Thank you very much, Natacha. It is great that we can have you cooperating with us today. I see that there are people from many places around the world. Thank you very much for being here with us. And I would like to 
underscore that if you have any questions uh, at any time, please send it through the question answer function. And also you may write in any language you want. We will translate these uh, questions into Spanish if needed. This event will last one hour. And after the presentation, we'll have a question and answer section with Nicole and Javier. We will start now. Now I am pleased to introduce Nicole and Javier. Nicole Christie is a researcher in history and theory of design and on studies of material culture in Chile and Latin America. She is a designer and a PhD in anthropology in material culture from the University College of London, a co-author of the book Resistencia Gráfica of 2016. Her work has focused on the study of productive processes in both graphic and industrial design from the perspectives of the anthropology of technique and the colonial thought. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Raquel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here uh, with us today. Thank you for the invitation. And I would like to uh, introduce Javier as well. Javier Amansi is a sociologist and archivist at the University of Chile. She is an independent researcher and curator on the intersections between art, politics, visual culture, and social movements. She is the co-author of the book Resistencia Gráfica with Nicole, and also as a researcher and feminist activist, she has published her work in books and magazines on political graphics and several other. Uh, topics. She is now the coordinator of the Red Conceptualismos del Sur. Thank you very much and welcome, Javiera and Nicole. And now I give the floor to Nicole, who will be starting this presentation today. Thank you very much, Raquel, for being here with us on this session. Thank you also to AG, AIJ Baltimore and AJI Unidos and SODA for this uh, effort to carry out this series on Latin American designs and its histories. So to start, before going deeper into this uh, research experience and the results of it, we would like to start by showing a short video that we did by collecting some fragments of different researches and investigation that we think speak for themselves. And it's a sort of uh, introduction to start this presentation. So Raquel, I don't know if you can share um, this video. We think the video speaks uh, for itself. So then we will be going deeper into the topic. de la tarde eh, desaparece a alguien matan a alguien encarcelan a alguien a las 4 de la tarde llega alguien cercano a pedirnos por favor que hay que anunciarle al mundo o a los más cercanos que ha pasado esa situación a las 5 de la tarde de las 4 a las 5 a las 6 recién estamos concibiendo el, el formato de, el, el diseño del afiche o lo que sea a las 8 ya estamos en venta trabajando con la foto mecánica, trabajando con esto, trabajando con lo otro y todas las noches ya estamos consiguiendo, mientras tanto, que queda un material acá, estamos consiguiendo que tiene la empresa que puede trabajar en la noche y si el otro día a las 8 de la mañana pasa alguien corriendo o a las 7 de la mañana pasa alguien corriendo clandestinamente y se lleva el, el material. La, eh, familiares tenían desaparecido de Lana González. Claro. Ah, claro, 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 claro. Eso es un rescate que hacíamos todo y, sí, y lo utilizábamos para un montón de cosas, pero quedaba el hecho. Claro. Ah, y esto, mira. ¿Te acuerdas, David? Sí. El cartel tiene una, una cuestión de carácter subversivo. Subversivo, digo, subversivo. 
subvertir, cambiar, transformar el orden establecido. Lo que se dice de las cosas, entre comillas, como normal, ¿cierto? Nos damos cuenta que no es normal que hay una, hay una irregularidad, una situación no considerada, no contemplada, entonces hay que alterar eso. Y la FICE, en esos años, ¿cierto? Tiene como tarea eh, dar cuenta testimonialmente, ¿cierto? Y técnicamente, ¿cierto? entregar la mayor cantidad de, de antecedentes posibles frente a las arbitrariedades, irregularidades, injusticias. Había una cooperación de un trabajo común. Es decir, uno llegaba como trabajador del arte con su idea, con su diseño, con su propuesta y se juntaba con el trabajador gráfico mm. y se hacía un producto, ¿verdad? que era el, el, el cartel. Entonces ahí cada uno hacía la parte que sabía. ¿verdad? Entonces eh, ellos en la fotomecánica, en la imprenta, tenían sus máquinas mm -hmm. y esas máquinas ellos eran los operarios, ellos mm -hmm. las sabían trabajar, sabían sacarle partido y ahí se establecía un diálogo para ver cómo era mejor para optimizar, para productivizar mejor el resultado. Mm. Y por eso que con medios muy precarios se pudieron hacer cosas bastante entretenidas. Sí, porque sí, la, 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 la calle, 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 la Sí, Era más bien valiente. Gracias, Raquel, por el video. Thank you, Raquel, for showing our video. Now I will share my screen. There we go. ready well before anything else uh, i was uh, looking at the chat so i wanted to greet all of you who are here with us today thank you for being here with us connected and we are uh, with javiera we are very happy to be able to share what we have gone through uh, in this uh, research uh, effort we have we have named this as a graphic uh, resistance it's about graphic art between 1973 and 1989 uh, during the military dictatorship basically on the apj and dasher soul uh, cultural center which are two groups we will go we will explain a bit more about them later We have been researching for many years in a cooperative effort. This research is, for the most part, uh, included in this book, this publication in 2016. It's called Graphic Resistance as well. And in it, we, uh, continued, uh, we, we continued the work on this research, but this is the basics the core of this collective effort we carried out. Part of this collective effort uh, is about intertwining the participation of the creators themselves, graphic artists themselves. They are our accomplices, let's say, our graphic accomplices, the group of investigation, the research group, Javiera, uh, a sociologist, Yana Roa, a designer as myself, and many, many other people and cooperations, many conversations that we held and different exchanges to arrive at this result. 
and also to really be able to publish this book. This research is, is published in Spanish, but you can access the book or at least the main conclusions of it at the journal design history where we published uh, an article on with this main conclusion and this is ava available in english in english in the special issue on latin american history so with that i will uh, go and give the floor to javiera so she tells us a bit more about the focus of the research Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you all of you for be, being here with us. We want to tell you that this is a research that we developed from an interdisciplinary view. We build it from the basics of design with different experiences. We focus on this look on production of both collectives, Dasher Sol and APJ, from building from their production networks, the subversion, which uh, resulted in each of the posters, which resulted in their militant military, militant uh, tasks, solidarity within this Pinochet's military dictatorship context. It was uh, tangible and, and intangible results. More than five years of investigation resulted in this book, and we uh, created some work from the personal archive of the, of the artists themselves. And we accessed um, uh, printing proofs and other material, and we widen the investigation with personal talks and other materials. It's mainly based on researchers and the exchange with researchers from this period. This is also an investigation or research that is located or shared within the context of Red Conceptualismo del Sur, an activist plot that has a plural position in South South and tries to act in the field of epistemological and artistic dispute. Since 2007, the network works to influence the dimension of the dimensions of artistic and curatorial practices under the idea that it is a political act intervening on different junctures. This research has been expanded in different ways and throughout the different processes related to the student movements, the feminist movements, and also what Nicole was mentioning before from the perspective of anthropology of these techniques. And this is something that we would like to say as well and to show as well, because nowadays we are talking from a, a, speci a specific time in Chile. During the dictatorship, we took the streets massively in the context of the social revolt that broke out in October 2019, and that has led to the first democratic process of our country. During the first month, we saw the walls of Santiago and different cities covered with scratches and slogans. And over these 30 years, that were the transition to the democracy. For us, it is very important to conceive this research process as a contribution to the continuity of these struggles and this resistance of the past and the present. This is an exercise of memory that adds to the creation of genealogies of political spheres in Chile and Latin America, feeding the struggles of the present and of the future. As Antonio Cadima says, and when, where, wherever there is a social movement, there is a poster. So graphic utopia, this starts from what was the main experience of Unidad Popular, the Popular Unity in 1970 or 73, 
under Salvador Allende government, where the strength there was very much related to the idea of a state, socialism, and the importance that the mass media had at that time in order to be able to distribute and to show the graphic identity or a, a political program as well. That's how the posters were essential in order to expand the idea, the social ideas. This graphic utopia, as we called it, is a synthesis, is a summary of the period where graphic language was part of an expansion of this emancipatory project, both in arts and in design. We will see a, a, a a strong link with the new technologies, mainly with the offset and with serigraphy as well as means of communication for mass communication that made everything uh, from a cultural and artistic point of view more massive. We will see that it was mainly characterized by a lot of colors, different and high contrast showing the Latin American style, and it was influenced as well by the American psychodelia and the typologies that were known by the, our fonts. And they were very much related to the muralism tradition that was present in this period as well. We are talking about large posters of medium mercury, 55 by 77 centimeters, or even mercury size that we could see in the streets or even in public institutions. So this idea is very much related to a, a call for democratizing art. We can see an exhibition here Pueblo Tiene Arte con Allende was the name. It was conducted in 80 places throughout the country. This exhibition tried to, made, to make different artists well known throughout the country. And it is interesting to see how this mechanic kind of language was emphasized and how it shows the arts in the artistic field I'm sorry, I lost. I lost sound of the speaker. She's back. So this possibility, I'm sorry, her sound is, is breaking. So all this power takes different identity. It includes art, schools, and within this context, in the UT, the Technical University, there was an exhibition shown mainly aimed at what was the risk, I think, that they saw coming their way. And that's why they had this anti-fascist exhibition organized together with different universities and with the support of the government as well in order to be opened in September 11, 1973. So that was going to be led by Salvador Allende himself, together with artists such as Victor Jara. This exhibition that included more than 500 copies would include 18 posters as well with different colors, high contrast, and they would be shown throughout the country as a call to resist but as you can imagine it was it couldn't be done because that same day that was the day that we had the coup d'etat in in chile salvador allende could not reach the university but victor Jara did and together with 60 uni university students and teachers who were resisting there. There were more than 600 people who were resisting in the university within a context where this exhibition that was already set there was the background for the military for the military group that attacked the country. This exhibition was witness 
to what started being the dictatorship that we had to undergo in Chile. So now moving on to some context to give you a bit more context about what was happening at that time in terms of graphic art and practice in terms of creating graphic art within a context such as the one we were describing where we still created these kind of posters colored posters and how as the context changed to a dictatorship and graphic art started being persecuted as well how the production methods changed the techniques changed as well and the ideas changed as well so on september the 11th after the coup and uh, it was also a coup for graphic art as well we they started persecuting graphic artists as well so five days after the military coup they imposed some bandos or decree laws that went over the constitution the constitution of 1925 where they where they forced that is to say by decree and in a dictatorial way to persecute graphic art and they said anyone i'm sorry i'm trying to read anyone caught printing or spreading propaganda that is subversive and undermining of the supreme government will suffer the sanctions contemplated by the military justice code for times of war that's how instead of graphic art being in the walls or being printed like this colorful etc it was hidden it had to be hidden so that's why we call this period the hidden times and the ones that were not subversive started being persecuted as well but it continued existing despite all of this together with these decree laws as part of all these measures to suppress or of censorship for all expressions that were against the military dictatorship we can also see Errazuriz and Gonzalo Leiva they called it the cleansing operation to dismantle the imaginary the imaginary that was called um, by at the time the marxist cancer this was created from the popular unity and by means of this cleansing operation they tried to cleanse or to clean the walls of the city it went hand in hand with other measures such as burning of books uh, cutting the hair men's hair short as well as stimulating or fostering the use of a certain kind of clothes so this cleansing operation throughout the city and in the imaginary of uh, the people cultural imaginary as well tried to replace everything by replaced with this nationalist and clean clean ideology so they went back to the use of our national icons the icons that would be disputed later on from the dictatorship as well as from the resistant movements and they were also trying to focus on some icons that fostered the spirit of patriotism together with all of this um, the persecution and the cleansing operation there was another interesting part to think about the graphic development of the time the creation of the new economic model by means of the dictatorship and by means of these kind of shock measures they were trying to implement the neoliberal model by means of the chicago chicago boys which was a group uh, created in the us that came to chile and as part of the process to consolidate the dictatorship and to leave its heritage 
they dismantled the economic system and they established a neoliberal system so that the possibilities of course the dictatorship enabled its installment without any kind of consideration to labor rights or without taking any care to local production so it was established radically and it is also very much related to design design in a more officialist way let's say publicity advertising corporate development that started taking a key aspect like being at the core of graphic design and that's why in the streets we started seeing an imaginary that was very much related to, to consumption much more than the imaginary that was proposed before during the popular unity and with the posters that talked about education or that talked about public health now this became an imaginary more related to consumption and corporate identity so we will see how despite the hegemony that this kind of language took, there would always be some kind of cracks, cracks that made this practice more difficult for the resistance. And this would be contaminating the city that was trying to be cleansed up and, and this corporate sphere. As part of one of the first uh, gaps in the city was the resource of R, of the letter R, uh, an R that it's in circled. That's going to be one of the first uh, popular symbols. It's a minimum resource that is reproduced to subvert this white, clean, uh, walls by this cleansing uh, brigades. So Alberto Perez, an academic and artist, started working with a very small group, uh, homemade uh, workshops, creating uh, black and white posters to be uh, put on walls of uh, fabric, fabrics and Etc. other buildings. So we see that graphics as well as music will be one of the first uh, responses as uh, that create a collective voice of resistance. So we start recognizing collective common spaces within a social uh, fabric that was broken by dictatorship, despite this constant persecution on artists and population as a whole, cultural spaces and universities started being intervened. But despite all of this, this was not a cultural shutdown tame. Actually, in opposition to this hege hegemonic official politics, there were many multiple resistance spaces in different spaces, different uh, universities, among students, among the people as a whole. And many of these groups started uh, intertwining during the 70s and the 80s. They were very prolific and they were able to uh, extend networks in exile. They insisted on community as part of resistance and also to have a thread of union with the left-wing culture. So in this context of cultural resistance that was very wide, there were two collectives, the Agrupación de Plástico Jóvenes, APJ, and Tasher Sol Cultural Center. APJ was founded in 1979 after the call of Hugo Sepulveda and Avilio Perez, who had known each other as students at the School of Fine Arts of the University of Chile. There were 130 students who founded the APJ to have a cultural resistance space. This was different from many other brigades that were part of these political scenes. They were open, 
meetings where hundreds of people took place. And then many more people started intervening over the eight years of uh, life that APJ had. Sonia de los Reyes, Marco Rissetti, Nan Godoy, Ana Maria Cisternas, many, many other people uh, participated in these meetings. The APJ was characterized as, with this collective work within assemblies on uh, uh, murals, scenographies created for theater plays, direct actions, which was the performances, let's say, and also the most prolific one of all, the graphic activities, graphic artists activities. The Tasher Sol Cultural Center was founded in 1977 by Antonio Cadima and Jorge Farias. It was the first autonomous cultural center to open its doors during the dictatorship. It was an experimental corner of friendship and art, a space that is open to organizations and people who fight for a popular and alternative culture from a poetic, audiovisual, musical and muralist creation. So in 1980, this workshop was made up of Felipe Martinez, Cadima, and Eduardo Gallén. The three of them comprised the first graphic design collective working for folk shows and cultural meetings, and also for different churches and human rights organizations. So at some point, Antonio Cadima leaves this space and starts working with other people with different graphic workshops and which even continue working to this day. There you can see some posters on screen. So this was a bit of the context it's part of the genealogy between uh, graphic design artists that go even beyond dictatorship. After reviewing some of the characteristics of the dictatorship for graphic design, and also after presenting these two collectives that we have been researching, we would like to delve deeper into the center of our research, which has to do with uh, getting closer to the back room, the graphic back room, to see what is behind the scenes of this, of this practice, what is behind those posters, and what we can find when we start seeing the different layers that are part of this productive process, this strategies. In order to do that, I uh, again show this uh, quote by Antonio Cadima that we heard on the video. I will, I will read it. Two o'clock, someone is killed and someone is put into prison. At four, someone comes to ask us, please, to know, to make known to the world what just happened. At five, we're already working on the format, the design of the poster. Meanwhile, we're trying to find a printing press, people who can work at night. At eight, we're at the press working on the photo me mechanics. And the next day at seven in the morning, someone comes hurriedly to take the material. What we see here, on the one hand, is uh, a willing to work, an urgency to practice this type of uh, art, working during the night, and also an urgency to communicate certain persecution, disappearances, and systemic violences during the dictatorship. And on the other hand, we can see different stages of the process. That is why we can identify the commission stage, then the design stage where different technical strategies are identified so that a 
poster can be made under this uh, censorship context, then we have the distribution stage and circulation itself. And what we concluded of the research is that there are many common strokes. We call common strokes some things that are in cross-sectional. Out of this common strokes, we name technical disputes, what we call the graphic social bone, collectivity and autonomy, and meandering circulation. So we will now go deeper into each one of them uh, as an overview, because we don't have much time, but we will try to give examples, concrete examples on each of these strategies. What we find interesting is that this common strokes uh, created a graphic trench, let's say, in this collective. They created a space to dispute dictatorship. And there is where people started trying to understand what we understand as politics through posters. So to start with this common strokes and with the technical disputes strategy, I wanted to show you some concrete examples. One of the interesting practices that we saw is the appropriation and the dispute over the use of offset printing. In offset, particularly in the multi-lit offset that was used during that era, one of the strategies that was used has to do with replacing the metal mold that is needed for photo mechanics before reproduction on the offset machine and how this metal mold implies having someone do that having a space that is willing to print some words that are being censored and also it implies money and as a third factor it also implies the difficulty of getting rid of this metal mold that it's not the same as getting rid of a paper mold in terms of how hot it is to get rid of the trails of this persecuted words persecuted posters and images. So this is where we started, uh, people started uh, experimenting to replace the metal mold with a paper mold. On the right, you see a Tashar Sol poster where there is uh, a more worn out quality where paper has absorbed some ink, which is something that does not happen with metal molds. But this type of uh, posters will be used as part of the identity of this era. We see also systematic and experimental use of, of copying machines. For instance, uh, it was called xerography by Kalima, for instance. And here you see what Antonio Kalima himself did. What he did was to zoom the small photographs that were printed on the press on journals for instance to give them high contrast and then to create this sort of uh, baroque posters they are quite simple so they can be printed on a single color by being by having this high contrast also the copying machine was used in many other ways to zoom on on this details of images to wear to wear out images with uh, as with offset printing machines you see something that's not quite clear that's uh, as if it was fragmented or with holes so there's a play on that use and at the same time, copies uh, allowed to include press clips 
clips where the dictatorship uh, administration uh, expanded or communicated their their tasks. So this is how censorship was shown, how this uh, journals censored artists and art. And thanks to the copying machines, this uh, clip started circulating. Also the typographic use, I don't want to go deep into that because we don't have much time, but it's interesting to see how the there's a play to uh, mimic some type fonts. There's also an experimentation with formats, which has allowed to maximize all the opportunities to see graphics and to minimize costs. So in that sense, for example, we have this 1984 series by APJ, which is a mural with made up with small pictures, small format pictures. And by putting it all together, we have a greatest, greater impact. We also have the open uh, poster, which created a matrix that could be flexible for different uh, works. Unions use this as well, so those materials could be used by many different groups. And so with that, we go to a different topic. This process, this productive process, or the emphasis, has also allowed us to reconstruct or to see how to create a poster is to create the social fabric. So it starts from a graphic link and how at each time, at every stage of the production, each piece represents a different way of bonding, of creating complicity, and it becomes part of it. So I will mention some of them very briefly. First, the stage of the request of the posters and this, the link is not based on clients, but on solidarity. There can be, it can be economically paid, but it's mainly based on the acknowledgement, mutual acknowledgement that they were both opposing the regime. So Tajer Sol held relations with different social organizations and they became part of this wide fabric of unions, human rights organizations, the artistic world, students' organizations that joined, joined this common space that was being reconstructed by means of each poster, which each of the calls, which each of the main slogans. And there is also some complicity that was very deep and important, as it was mentioned in the video as well, related to the operators that worked with the machines in the factories, with the copying machine at the neighborhoods. And that's how these graphic collectives could be consolidated and later on to relate themselves to those people who were working with these machines, but with complicity, you know, working at night in clandestine contexts under the risk of persecution and how they could keep on making printed copies by being based on these strong links and then to expand these networks by means of of other workshops. The idea was for them not to be the only ones in charge of making these posters, but kind of trying to multiply the capacity throughout the organizations, the um, union organizations or, or neighbors organizations, so that they could self-manage their own resources and create this kind of communication material. 
So you can find a great diversity of areas and groups that they linked, that they were linked to in a way of understanding collectivity. They insist on saying that they need to reaffirm the need of collective creation. It was a political strategy as well that goes against the individualism that prevailed at the time and that prevailed because of the dictatorship, the lack of trust of the or the fear, I would even call it. So creating networks or affirming this collective need that would protect one another. So, for example, not signing with your own name any posters. So that's part of what created the new way of thinking about graphic art. And this led, among other things, to leave the different sectors that also includes in the left, that also exists in the left, and to become cooperators or cooperators in a wider sector with different parties, different organizations. They said, we are, do not belong to a party because we are a group of all different parties. So implying the left activism. This capacity of creating links was very strong in the ways in which posters circulated. It's not just a poster that you will see in an avenue or in the main walls of the country, but you will find this kind of meandering circulations to appear in the public spheres. So one of the most characteristic ways was to make it circulate in demonstrations, in marches. After the death of Andres Gerlan, for example, in these kind of demonstrations that was called to the Cathedral of Santiago, the photographs that we can see here on the screen were taken after these posters were circulated in the demonstration and that had been printed the night before. As you can see, there is a strong emphasis on that. I mean, a poster was something essential and it was essential to bring it out to the streets in the demonstrations. Another way of circulation was also using the posters inside, not on outside walls, but inside, inside um, human rights institutions, churches, or neighbor organizations, where they started putting all these posters inside, not shouting out on the outside, but as a way of identifying themselves, of keeping this memory on the inside. So um, these posters had a lot of details and they showed a kind of perspective. It implies that we had to look in detail at these posters so that we could identify ourselves. And many families went there or they were asking for, waiting for an answer of relatives that had been detained or who had had their rights violated. So they go hand in hand with their ex the experience of the population. And something else that was very powerful in terms of uh, posters, this poster called Libertad, Freedom, was very strong and powerful. It talked about clandestine experiences, and this created a link with exile, the exile of Jose Balmes, in this case, the artist who reproduced this understanding of the culture. It, it was conducted together with a French organization and this was done in Paris. This was 1985 in Paris and it created a possibility to imagine how to expand these Mandarin circulations abroad, of course, trying to escape the censorship and trying to wrap up because I know that we are uh, Yes, we are running out of time. This usually happens with for us. But well, anyway, so going into the conclusions of this process. Thinking about this process as step by step and as a kind of relations, political, graphic, artistic relations of 
the photocopies, the graphic arts, everything that goes together. And if we zoom in and in, we can see what lies within each of these areas. We can see a graphic trench, so to speak. We identified these as technical disputes, as the graphic social bond, the collectivity and the autonomy that people were focusing on, working in time or against time, and the mentoring circulations that we mentioned before. And we can see how, by means of all these common issues, they created a kind of graphic trench. And that's what we propose here. We say that the political part of posters, it's not, it's not only the slogans or it's not only fi the final result of a poster, but it is also the practice of it. And we can think of practice as a political practice as well in itself. That's why we address the politics the, of the backroom, let's say the backroom politics, where graphics not only accompany the political process, but also has the capacity to transform and has a purpose in itself. That's why instead of talking about graphic of resistance, where it, it would imply that it is accompanying the process of resistance, we would rather call it graphic resistance, where the practice in itself, I mean, understood as such as a process that was created as such, it acts as the political part of posters, the political content of posters. We would like then just to wrap up to repeat something very key of this process, the possibility of creating research and archives, how these archives were created, how access was being granted increasingly more and more, and how Nowadays, they call these vibrating materials because they vibrate with every print, with every background that they recreate. And this is the witness and testimony of their of these people's experiences. Memoria de la Resistencia, Taller Sol, these are open spaces for the community. They exist and they are in, for example, in Yungay neighborhood, and they can have access to most of these documents, not only about the graphic arts, but also about the cultural resistance, together with other strategies, as the one we tried to implement here, archives in use. This is a platform that is available to have access to see these posters. We believe it is very important to think about how research can also create a link or the capacity to create um, a fabric or a link or complicity, if you want to call it, that can be socialized by means of a research process, by means of a process that shows the possibility to continue expanding on this kind of research into the future. And finally, taking or based on this capacity of the research that can create greater archives, a greater amount of archives in order to socialize and to open up all the information that we already have, we are interested in thinking about the importance of these as designers of creating an archive of our own practices and the experience and the importance of the stories, the history of design, and creating more spaces for designers, for objects themselves, for productive processes, and for productive practices. Because those techniques have a social aspect to it as well, and they are part of this fabric that makes it possible to have a final tangible result. And just one final comment, we are very much interested in emphasizing that this was a research where we had this, this process that was conducted always hand in hand with the main 
protagonists of these or the main actors of this process. So we were thinking together, making a, like a joint brainstorming about how this practice, this graphic practice was conducted during the 70s and the 80s. So that's it. This is uh, just to wrap up. And now we open up for a Q&A session. We wrap up our presentation to open up for a Q&A session. So thank you, Raquel. The floor is back to you. Thank you both. It's a great research, great analysis, very deep, very, uh, I mean, it encompasses a lot of things. We are all very moved by these kind of stories. You know that in Brazil, very similar things happened. So it implies a lot of courage to conduct the research that you conducted. And it also shows the courage of the graphic artists of the 70s and the 80s as well. A lot of information to process. You've given us a lot of information, so thank you indeed. We do have some questions here and we are running out of time. We don't have time for all of them, but we will just start with some of them, some of the questions posed by the audience. If we don't have time to answer them all, I will send them to you by email, if you agree, so that we can answer them if we don't have enough time to answer them all. So the first question by Maria Malagini, she says, good afternoon, great presentation, and I would like to answer the researchers. If you have detected during your research any link to those people who are living in exile during the dictatorship period, uh, in Chile. Was there any graphic relation between the APJ and the Charasol and like towards the exile? Thank you and warm greetings to you all. Thank you very much for the question. Well, Javi, I don't know if you want to answer to take that question. During the presentation, you uh, spoke about that uh, that link with Jose Balmes, right? Yes, we think it's very important to underscore that sometimes historiography on uh, art history and design history uh, sets uh, limits between what happened within the country and outside the country. And research show that it, the capacity to produce, it's much more prolific through different uh, careers that uh, were going into and outside of exile. Something in the case of APJ, Valmes was in France, and also there were participations in different uh, cultural centers or cultural coordinators that started building different links, uh, solidarity links. So there's, uh, there's something to go deeper into, which were the strategy and the tension that there was, but because there was tension related to what happened within the country. Those who decided to stay as a political action, a political stance, and those who uh, exiled. So we found that that was very interesting. There were different traditions and they intertwined in different ways with, um, posters produced in different uh, Latin American countries or European countries as, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. There's a, uh, another question re as regards the geographic uh, location. Isabel Borowski says, how did this graphic links came up? Were they, did they expand all over the country? Well, that's a very interesting question. Our particular research is focused on Santiago, on these two collective groups that worked in Santiago in particular. However, the, it's very interesting to see how there is a language and technique and icon exchange or that goes much beyond Santiago. There's also a workshop that was located in Concepcion. 
which created a very iconic poster that actually went much beyond Concepcion itself. So I believe there was an exchange, but there's a part of the research that we did not develop because we focus on these two collective groups on Santiago. And I think that would be a uh, beautiful work to try and think about these different networks all over the, the country. I think it's even necessary to do, to do this type of research. I love your work uh, because it's uh, related to this cooperation networks, which are very much needed. So a different question about techniques. Many posters seem to have um, hand-drawn type. Is that correct? And can you comment on the artist's style or influence of the type? Well, the most, the greatest influence we found came from the uh, different catalogs where many times we were not able to access this said uh, type because it was uh, expensive. People um, worked on top of that to copy it, copy that type and use it in different posters. We They also use different uh, letters it's themselves, letters from press clips and magazines and also uh, handwritten types because many times, uh, it was spontaneous work, it was handwritten as well. And I think a reproduction there is interesting because when you work with photography to reproduce in a much more precarious way, allowed the use, uh, allowed for a more limited use of text of type. It's Techniques are a result of the op options or resources that were available at the time. We can see that. And there's also a question as regards the process. Um, the graphic production decisions, the productive decisions regarding offset or photocopy. So the question is from the graphic movement against climate change perspective to support this need for uh, the ephemeral. How, how do you see these techniques today with the challenges of that are posed by climate change? Well, it's a beautiful question, really. Um, I would say that what we witness on this period is an insistence to communicate, to be visible, to say, to transmit in any way they could to with different languages, with different visual techniques. Of course, resources were very limited, but there was, was also, there was also a desire to experiment. There was a call to not um, only do posters that are, were reproducible, but they were monochromatic, they were, they were not very visually uh, attractive. So there was an open question as regards uh, devices, techniques, and strategies. So these questions are, are very uh, much of the present. We have to think about how we can use technology and also hack strategies that social network provide to think about this capacity to subvert a graphic design, um, a design that answers the needs of the present. So I would focus on that. We're seeing uh, a multiplication of graphic activism where there are many strategies. There are stencils on walls or there are there's a use of paper. There's the use of uh, QR codes, different strategies to continue being visible. 
And also something that we see is the reuse. Maybe Nicole can explain that much better. This is a uh, research related to having a poster that can be reused, recycled to have the same graphic sign used for uh, giving many messages. I think Javi, you explained that uh, really well. It's precisely that. It's the possibility to maximize use. There are some, this logic of maximizing use within the dictatorship had a cost, had a persecution as a result. But it's also important to think about this in a sustainable way because right now we should focus on maximizing use it's key to have this strategy and we were using we're seeing that that this strategy was used by both collectives yes it's really really important to know history for this reason itself because there were there are many strategies that we can access that we can rethink today and give them different uses. So, Nicole and Javiera, we are limited by time, unfortunately. So, thank you very much. I am sure that everyone loved your work and your presentation. It's a starting point to a conversation that we will continue having. So thank you very much. And now I would like to thank all the participant, the participants that stayed with us. And I wanted to give you some space for some final comments and then we can say goodbye. Well, uh, I wanted to thank you once again for this invitation. This was a research that we published five years ago on the Resistencia Gráfica book. And many of its questions are uh, current, but are also open to be linked with the experience of different uh, countries or territories thinking about the 70s or the 80s in other countries in Latin America or the global south even. And we think there are many practices of resistance, ongoing resistance. Even in today, we are rethinking neoliberal contexts because we are uh, dismantling the Pinochet uh, constitution. So we love go going back on that, on that time to analyze our present. And to pick up on what Javier was saying, well, it's incredible to see how when we were researching this for this book, and also when we were, uh, we were seeing this, uh, social revolt in Chile recently. It's impressive to see how graphic practice is still alive, even though we have uh, the possibility of disseminating things digitally. digitally. There's something that goes uh, from generation to generation. We see screen, pa screen painting, we see the streets of Santiago that were not um, well, those who were not uh, cleaned, we see the posters, we see the insistence on graphic, on graphics as a political language. So, yes, it's beautiful really to see that. And as well as beautiful, it is um, challenging, I would say. It's challenging to see that today, some things are coming back but we will continue to resist surely so nicole and javiera thank you very much thank you very much to all the volunteers who were with us and please if you have time 
uh, answer our survey so that we can know more about your experience and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. And thank you to all of you who stayed with us so far. Goodbye.